just have to laugh. I've done this introduction so many times, this time I'm gonna get it right. Hi, my name is Jeremy Chara. I'm the founder and CEO of VIA. We are a technology service provider uh, that was literally built by and for charter schools. And I wanna say a big thank you to all of you that have clicked on that on-demand presentation for the Arizona Charter School Foundation. I will be hugely respectful of your time because I know the amount of time it takes to go through all the presentations and all the materials. This will be worth your time because I'm going to give you the remedies for the top seven technology challenges that exist at charter schools. And you may have the first question, how do you, Jeremy, know the top seven challenges of charter schools? Well, we serve thousands of students and teachers that, that are working at charter schools that we support. And we pulled literally 28,000 tickets that we've collected over the last year. And I sat down with my team and it's, I mean, it's, it's crystal clear. It's like, bing, bing, bing. These are the top seven challenges of charter schools and we have solutions for them. These are not going to be solutions like, oh, just give us a call. This is not a marketing presentation. This is literally how you solve them. Now, just to make it fun, I'm gonna do it a little creatively. So I'm going against every marketing principle that they tell you, save the best for last. I'm literally going from the top one down. Student and staff devices are exploding. And this is fire and, and, and death that is occurring for all of these different devices. This shows up in a variety of ways, whether it would be slow computers, dying computers, uh, failing network equipment, uh, you know, hey, oh, my screen cracked, the laptop doesn't close right anymore. I don't, I can't, it, it doesn't charge. I, if I unplug it, it immediately goes dead. I mean, again, when you're going through 28,000 tickets, you see a lot of this kind of stuff. It's just constant, constant. I need a new device is, is what it boils down to. The solution to this is twofold. Part one of the solution is to simplify. And this is by moving away from on premise equipment. Now we've all heard of the cloud and oftentimes we are even using the cloud in our charter schools, but servers still stick around, whether it would be domain servers, which are the ones that control all those devices that continually fail or slow down or, or things like that. Uh, or there's servers that run a bell system or a camera system or all that, that sort of stuff. The big thing is to simplify by moving to a cloud-based management system for your devices. So I'm, I'm specifically focused on devices. I'll come back to those servers in a second. By moving to a cloud-based system, and what I mean by that is moving to a Microsoft 365 or a Google Workspace solution, you can automate the onboarding of new devices, right? So, so as that device dies and fails, it needs to be replaced. That's a huge challenge. I'll, I'll talk about part two of the solution of the device itself in just a moment, but it's a huge challenge to bring it in, adopt it to the domain, put all the policies, make sure the file access, the printers are installed. Uh, all of that stuff takes time and often saps your resources in your charter school. If you're using a cloud-based systems, the devices out of the box as, as a new device can join to it and be auto provisioned. And matter of fact, Microsoft calls it autopilot to where all of your school policies, all of your school applications, they all show up on that device to where this is, this is the big one. You make the devices disposable. The big challenge, big time time consumer and resource consumer is that the devices become like snowflakes. They're all kind of unique. You got to tweak them all and all that. Yeah. Make the devices disposable to where if you are providing your teacher's devices, you make them in, in such a way that you can just say, Oh, that's dead. Throw it away, bring in a new one. And it automatically adopts all the policies and everything else. Furthermore, the cloud is BYOD friendly. Now, and there's many ways to set it up, but if you allow your teachers to use their own device or that's, that's the preferred standard, they can bring it from home and literally gain access to those cloud resources from their own device in one sense. And this is where I go <laughs> in one sense, it remedies a lot of issues because if their device dies, most of the time staff will be like, ah, it's my device. I got to fix it. I got to figure that out. And people have become accustomed to that. Or, hey, my device just died. Can I get a, 
a, a, a school issued device, right? That's, that's one, one way that you can approach it. The second thing that you can do to greatly simplify and save the resources at your charter school is to implement a device life cycle. Far too often, and it's just human nature, you don't fix, <laughs> if it's not broken, don't fix it, right? Well, the challenge with devices is as time goes on and we move from three to four to five years, which should be a limit, the devices reach their lifespan, meaning they start to slow down. All the, all the challenges that we mentioned at the very beginning, slow computers, dying computers, pieces breaking. I mean, uh, people with small screwdrivers, taking laptops apart, putting in memory, oh, oh. Talk about draining all of the resources. Instead, implement a life cycle. In, in Arizona, we use a company called ER2. You don't have to use them. There's a thousand companies like them, or at least a hundred. Um, that is an equipment recycler. What we do is at our schools, we keep five spare devices at all times in a stack. They are brand, brand new, I'll explain that in a second, ready for use. So if somebody's device breaks, they're not out of commission. They literally come to the receptionist, device is down, here, here's a new one, type in their password and a couple minutes later, they're back up and running. That's, that's again, the power of the cloud approach, right? That old device goes into a box in the, in the MDF, the, the server room, right? In a box, and once that box reaches its limit, then we call ER2. They come take all of the old ones, we refresh the, the stack of devices that's there and just hand them out as, as we go, right? It is a life cycle, and as the devices reach a certain age, which I'll tell you later, we, we track all of that and, and, and so on and so forth, but when it reaches a certain age, it is a mandatory replacement because after that certain amount of time, it begins to become problematic more and more and more until it just overflows. And that's where you start getting, oh, we need more help desk people. We, and now you're talking about full-time salaries of people that are coming in with little screwdrivers when if you look at the big picture, it's so much more resource, morale, and cost effective to, to just re life cycle these devices. For most schools, devices cycled once every three to five years, five years is kind of pushing it, uh, is, is fine. There's also a lot of, I, I, I jotted down here, reuse devices are a thing. They're, you know, for instance, ER2, they get batches of devices from businesses that come in that have only been used a couple years because that's their life cycle. And those, you know, thousand devices from whatever company out there, Nike, let's just say, uh, can now be repurposed and still have a very decent life for educational systems inside of there. So many device issues remedied with this also, as it before it slips my mind, the E-rate program, government funding for network devices and devices that provide internet access. They renew your funding once every five years for a reason. That's a good life cycle. Five, at most seven years for network devices. They should be cycled out uh, before they become problematic taking down your system. More on the network in just a moment. When I was drawing this guy, I was considering putting some evil Halloween looking face on there, but I thought, no, this is a happy presentation. Printers, number two issue of all the 28,000 tickets we reviewed. Death by a thousand paper cuts. Printers are well known in the charter school technology sphere as just being one of those things where it's like, oh no, you know, printers down. Ah, I, I have to walk so far to the printer. Can I print color, black and white? It seems, you know, it seems like there's a line down these pages. Ah, the, 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 you know, there's a paper jam. It got crumpled up. Ah, first and foremost, solutions. So, so first off, I've, before I hit my paper, know that printers are a very physical device. I mean, if you think about it, think about the complexity of, of printers. You've got, you know, a ton of rollers moving objects that are literally, <laughs> literally paper thin, right? Paper thin through all of these rollers, putting powdery substance on there, fusing it with a laser, right? And spitting it out the other side. That's just bound to go wrong. It's, there's just so much intricacy inside of printers that even the best ones will require maintenance. And that's why the number one uh, solution, I'm sure many, I, I don't have to uh, beat the drum on this one because I'm sure most of you already have this, a printer management company. Unless you want your teachers or your staff sitting there with small screwdrivers, fixing rollers and broken pieces of plastic. Ah, I can't imagine that. So 
The printer management company uh, comes and not only maintains the printer or fixes it if it broken, uh, it's broken, but also brings you the ink that you need, notifies you when, when life cycle things are happening, replaces you know, a lot of the, the ongoing just maintenance of that, right? We know what printer management companies do and they are invaluable. But there's more to it than that. You can have a great printer management company and still have a ton of issues because of BYOP. People nowadays, technology has become very commoditized, very, you know, it's easy, says everybody. And so they'll go to Costco because Costco has a sale and, and grab a, a great looking printer. And it, maybe it is a great printer, right? But as soon as you bring that in, you've introduced yet another piece of ongoing maintenance and support. And a lot of the printer management companies won't touch those things because they know these commoditized printers are not designed for long, 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 they, they don't last long, right? <laughs> so, so they will make sure that they, that those are excluded. And what starts as a great thing, one becomes a major cost because the ink, and I drew <laughs> the worst kind of printer that you can have an inkjet for cost, ongoing cost. A lot of times organizations will give inkjet printers away. I mean, like retail stores, hey, this is free after rebate, right? Um, because they know you're, they're gonna make a ton of money handling the ink and the aftermarket ink, all that, don't go there because they will explode, they'll leak and they'll just, it, oh, oh, ban BYOP. If, if your company needs another printer, go through the printer management company, Find another place where you can buy an industrial grade printer, one that's designed for efficient printing, right? One that will last and that can be supported. Otherwise you find, again, that your help desk continues to expand because you have guys running around fixing everybody's personal printers that they brought in and trying to get them working. The last one, and this is huge, huge. If, as, I, as I look through all of the, the tickets that, that we were reviewing, a lot of them is like, hey, how can you put that printer on my device? Teachers, staff, administration. I mean, we, we support a lot of charter management organizations, CMOs, where, where the staff will go to different schools. And as they arrive at that school, they're like, oh, I need, to, I need that printer. I need that printer. Constantly adding printers to BYOD, staff devices all over the place. You want to invest in some cloud-based printing software. We use a, a product called PrintLogic. Um, and what it does is instead of having to set up a server that deploys the printers and all the right drivers and all that stuff that's maintained by you, you can set up a cloud-based system, meaning people that bring, and, and it becomes very easy to train people, um, <laughs> yeah, right? Um, I, I know that uh, you don't know who I have, but it, very simple to teach people to go to a website and it literally will list all of the printers that are there. They simply click it. It detects what operating system they're using, whether it's a Mac, a Chromebook, a PC, and bam, puts all the right drivers on there. Makes your IT staff life so much easier. Otherwise, you just have constant tickets and calls coming in. All right, number three. We can't connect. Wi-Fi and internet challenges. One problem, many manifestations. And you've heard them and they may probably even experience them themselves, yourself. Hey, when I go in that room, it's like a Wi-Fi dead zone. Oh, the internet's down. What? Ah, we were in the middle of online classes or online student testing. Ah, you know, or, or uh, you know, uh, well, as I, as I walk to that area, it, it just gets spotty. It seems like you know, this device works okay, but this device doesn't. Ah, right? Wi-Fi internet challenge is the number three issue that, that we are constantly seeing at charter schools. The solution to this is first off to realize Wi-Fi is not simple. One of the biggest things that I see, see uh, administrators do is like my, my, you know, it's better at my house than it is at the campus. Why can't, you know, I, I know what I did. I went to Best Buy or I went on Amazon and I ordered this thing and I set it there and it works, right? Well, when it comes to Wi-Fi, when you introduce a large area and a whole bunch of wireless access points, it becomes a major challenge because they all share the same radio frequency. 
It's, it's, it's as if, you know, you know it's it, like walkie-talkies, right? You know, when they're on the same channel, it, as soon as somebody else talks besides you two, it, there's challenges. And that's why home environments are so easy. There's so few devices there and such a small landscape compared to what you run into in a larger organization. So the solution to this issue, there's actually many fold, uh, multiple solutions. Number one. First thing that you want to do is perform a wireless site survey. I, I just mentioned we have this shared radio frequency, right? There's only a certain amount of, of frequency that, that all your wireless devices can use, right? And the more saturated that is and the more devices that use it, the, the more difficult it, it is to give good wireless network connectivity. So sometimes adding wireless access, like that's everybody's instinct. Oh, we just got to add another WAP, add another WAP, add another it can actually make the problem much worse because now you're adding even more devices blasting signal that is in this limited radio frequency, right? So you want to perform a wireless site survey. There's special equipment out there that you can walk around and it will tell you what are your weak spots, but more importantly, how saturated is the frequency in this area? Because we can move devices and WAPs to different frequencies and tune the building appropriately doesn't matter what Wi-Fi equipment, the most popular is Cisco Meraki, uh, <laughs> easy for me to say, Cisco Meraki or Ubiquiti or, or uh, Aruba, it doesn't matter what equipment you're using, they all share the same radio frequency, right? So, so you have to make sure that you place them in the right locations based on your building traffic. Where do people go? Where is the congregated groups of devices, right? Number two, Make sure your key staff is given Wi-Fi keys. <laughs> again, I know it sounds funny, but, but oftentimes the top tickets that, again, drain the resources out of your charter school and force you to hire more and more help desk is because uh, people don't have the key. Hey, what's the wireless key for this? Hey, I brought in a new device. What's this? And it, think of it. By the time they send in a ticket, how many of your staff have they gone, hey, uh, Sally, do you have the, oh, no, you don't have it, you know, and Sally's going to, so how, how much lost productivity is there simply because we don't have the keys? Now, now, keep in mind, I know when you're thinking keys, security, wait, isn't that a security issue? Well, again, this is why I go back to the cloud. By moving the stuff in your campus to the cloud, your network security is not as, it, it, it's always important, but it's not as important as it used to be when you had all of your stuff on site where you could have intrusions and cybersecurity on site was a major issue. Now, if all you have is internet connectivity at your campus, there's not that much to secure. So pre-shared keys or, or, you know, hey, just type in this key and you're online works very well in those environments so much more I could go into on the cybersecurity side, but I won't, not yet. Um, create a specific network for IoT. You know what that is? Internet of things. Everything's online nowadays. Your, your thermostats in your building, your printers oftentimes will connect wirelessly, uh, video surveillance, cameras, things like that, wireless connectivity. And often if the, you, you join them to a network and sometimes people will rotate the keys and they'll remember maybe half of the devices and you'll have connectivity issues for months every single time you change the password for the wireless network. Uh -uh. Create one wireless network just for those devices. You can have multiple networks, right? Call it IoT, make the, sure, make the, make the key very complex, but never change it. Never give it to anybody. Don't, don't let staff get on that network because that is designed to never change. So those devices where you have to sit on the little, you know, the little screen on the printer and whatnot, you don't have to do that because a, a, a key change happened. Last but not least, when it comes to internet connectivity, invest in a dual connection. Oftentimes you'll have a fiber connection as your primary stability, reliably, <laughs> stable, reliable, and consistent, right? Is, is fiber optic uh, networks. But sometimes that will still go down with an SD-WAN device or with multiple internet connections. For all our schools, we have one fiber and we have one DSL coax or sometimes even cellular uh, because it, it'll just be a, a failover connection. If this one drops, it'll automatically jump over to this. Yes, is it a 80 to 150 to maybe $200 a month charge for that secondary circuit? Absolutely, but keep in mind, you lose the internet connection for an hour and you've paid for that for five years, you know, it, it, like for, with the lost productivity that your campus goes through. So, so that's, that's, that's your remedies for the number three, we can't connect uh, issues.
Item number four, handling applications. And you saw I put on there, sneaky foxes. Why do I say that? Well, the applications in your system often skip what normally would have become a process in your charter school, right? Because they're kind of like onesie, twosie things that pop up. Like everybody uses, let's just say, for example, everybody gets Windows. Everybody gets Microsoft 365, Word, Excel, um, PowerPoint, all, all the other applications. That, you've got your standard thing. And then there's that guy down the hall. Oh, I, hey, I, and I, I literally drew up the, the most commonly requested applications that we have. Visio and Acrobat PDF Professional um, that, that comes in. Oh, the guy down the hall. Oh, I need, I need Visio on my laptop. So the reason I call this sneaky little fox is because it goes straight to IT. Now, what does IT go? IT do? They go, well, you have to buy Visio. It's not free. You have to buy Adobe Acrobat, it's not a thing. And so it's kind of, it's push. this is how it normally happens. Push back the user. It's like, oh, I have to buy it. The user's like, oh, uh, well, uh, let me, let me, uh, let me go to my manager. Hey, can I get, you know, I need Visio because I need to da da da. The manager's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. And so, so they, they, t you see where this is going, right? They're, they're like, uh, I got an approval and the IT department's like, okay. So, and now IT is like, I guess, I guess. So they start making up processes on the fly. They're like, I guess we'll just buy that. Oh wait, no, we should go, it should go on their account with them. You see where this goes? This is why they're sneaky little foxes because they get in there and IT who's, who shouldn't be involved in your purchasing directly, they shouldn't be involved in, in the process to pro procure things, right? They're supposed to just get the application and put it on the device, right? And make it work. So you end up with a whole bunch of wasted time and resource and it goes on forever. Like they're, they're so sneaky because they're, it's like, okay, we figured that out, right? It took us like four hours to get that thing. But, but at, the, at the end of that, okay, that's fine. Two months later, it happens again. Or another month later, it happens again. Like you can go years uh, wasting just time and time and time in cycles. And again, hiring more staff, more, more lost productivity because they sneak in there and never get addressed correctly. So the solution to this is threefold. All right, first off, you want to create an approval process. What I mean by that is you want to treat applications just like anything else that need to be purchased, just like devices, just like, so, so when you're thinking about applications, when you think, Hey, you know, Bob needs Visio, you know, it's one thing if Bob, Bob needs paper clips, right? They're, they're down the hall. They're, they're a dollar, right? But Visio could be a, you know, multi-thousand dollar, uh, software purchase over the years that he's using it. Cause just about everything has gone to a monthly recurring cost, right? So, so first off, and this, this for, for us, for VIO, as we support all these different charter schools, this is the biggest challenge that we've run into is the charter school will often have different approval processes and it takes them a little while to be like, oh, applications are a thing. And, and they're, they're a thing just like anything else that we buy. It's not something that should come in as just a help desk ticket. Somebody, there has to be an approval. You, you see where that goes, right? So, so develop this, be proactive and create this knowing this is coming or has already come at your charter school. The second is create a license management system. Oh my goodness. How much illegal stuff has happened where, where somebody's like, okay, I bought that one license and now I'm, oh, oh, well, Sam needs it too. And, and Sally needs it three. And, and now, now the IT folks are like, well, it's, uh, you know, the IT folks are there to make something work. Right. Um, so oftentimes they'll just kind of, well, there it is. And if an audit ever happens, you find out that, Hey, we we've been pirating software unintentionally. Right. So use a license management system. What we've used and it, it, this has been like oxygen for, for uh, day to day life is this software called PAX eight. It's a cloud based company. Um, and they, they, they handle the thousand most common applications, uh, for all the license, you know, you know how all the billion licenses and it's complex PAX eight will simplify it so much for you or your IT department to manage what are the licenses and who has them inside of our company, right? All in one place, multiple vendors. It's good. It's good. By the way, I don't, this is all pure of heart transparency. I don't, I have no relationship or no referral bonus for any of these. This is just what works. The last piece of this is after you get the approval, after the license management system, you have to have a technical deployment process. Meaning by moving to that, I, I, I sound like a broken record, that cloud-based management system, you want to make your devices disposal 
uh, disposable. So Bob's device breaks, IT's never gonna remember that he had Visio on there, right? So you can use software like Azure Endpoint Manager or Datto or Kaseya, or there's so many of them out there that allow you to catalog, catalog the applications and what devices they're on, tie it to the user. So when that user logs into a new device, you gotta breathe. All the applications automatically install from the cloud instead of the IT person going, oh, you forgot this, oh, you forgot that, and having to reinstall them manually on each device. That will solve, that will greatly mitigate that number, that top four issue, application number five. Number five, I've gone fishing. We've seen varying levels of, of tickets when we step in to assist at a charter school, uh, technically speaking, right? Um, not so much based on culture, like, oh, well, some teachers are really good at, at seeing phishing emails and some aren't. It's more so based on a lot of the technical advancements that have been implemented. That's some of the solution that, that I'm going to talk about, but I want to make sure you're aware of the problem. When, when phishing emails come in, uh, they're emails that look uh, as though they came from somebody valid and they're either wanting you to click a link or a lot of times phishing emails can be very targeted. They'll be like, hey, can you send, you know, a thousand dollars to uh, such and such or grab some gift cards or something like that. And it looks like it's coming from the CEO. There's been a ton of money lost because of this. Um, uh, but all of these fall under the, the guise of email or communication coming in from an invalid source in an attempt to try and either get money or compromise that device and what they're after when they compromise the device is typically those email credentials when somebody clicks that e that phishing and types in their email address and password that then gives control of that person's email to another organization which continues the phishing attacks and attempts to get money and you know they can send emails as you and start blasting all kinds of different places with email it can become a major resource consumption finding and remedying a lot of those infected devices so here's the solution the first one will actually remedy 90 some percent of your phishing and that is enabling multi-factor authentication for people logging into their email the first time from a new location here's what i mean um, multi-factor authentication is using some device like a like a phone right to secondarily authenticate you so you type in your username and password right to check your email and then it says, oh, what is your code? And you go on your phone, you've done this, right? But oh, it's 59692, right? And it's changing every so often. So, so by having multi-factor authentication, when somebody gets your email credentials, which it happens all the time, knowingly or unknowingly by the user, they may pass those on. If they try and log in from overseas or outside the United States or outside your state or region, um, it will automatically prompt them, hey, what's your MFA? And they're stuck. They, even though they have your credentials, they can't get in because MFA is required the first time they log in. We have seen a massive, and I'm talking hundreds of tickets that would come in monthly for phishing attacks and compromised email. We have seen those virtually eliminated almost 100% by enabling MFA, that's a big one. The second one sounds sounds like a waste of time, but it's really not, and that is smart phishing training. What I mean by underlining smart is interactive. I mean, people like me always stand up, oh, you know, you see an email, it's from the, yeah, you gotta look at it. That doesn't work because people are numb to information off the time. So they're just like, okay, yeah, yeah, and they're still clicking on the email. Systems like the most most common one I've seen people use is uh, the site called Know Before. You can just Google that. Uh, but there's there's a lot of other ones. We use, for instance, we use a, one that's built into a lot of our day to day systems. It's not Know Before, but what it does is it sends out emails from your organization that are phishing emails, right? It's, it actually sends to everybody on your team. And the ones that click on it show up on, a, actually when they click on it, it takes them to a website that's like, you've been had, you know, or something. And it's like, here's a video you can watch on how you could have prevented that in the future, right? Their manager also gets a note saying, hey, Sally and, and such and such clicked on the phishing email. So that manager can come in. I mean, at that point, people are very highly motivated not to click phishing emails, right? Not only is it like, oh, I've, you know, you, you've, 
I don't want to say it this way, but you kind of feel dumb, right? You're like, oh, they got me. And now I know my manager knows. And now I know some systems giving me a video. Like that, that will teach them. We've seen a lot of reductions on people who click phishing emails just based on that, that sort of training. And the last one is good, you know, good fit, setting up email properly. If you set up your email properly, bogus emails that come in from the outside pretending to be somebody inside will be blocked, right? Improper email setup means other people can get in. I could, I could talk on and on and about that, but that those three things will solve the, top, the, the number five top issue in your charter school technically. The number six most common issue that we've seen in charter schools, we call find that file. That is a file is missing or lost or deleted, or it's the wrong version. And you know, there's a bunch of text that was there and it's not there anymore, or, or it was destroyed. Meaning I had it on my laptop. I dropped it in the lake or, or the laptop just doesn't turn on anymore. These can consume so much time because the, the technical staff that you have are now there trying to find it. They're like, okay, did you misplace it? Oh, I don't know. It was, it was called, I think it was, you know, file 1721. And, and so they're using all the methods they can to search and so on and so forth. And oftentimes they end up finding it and somebody just misplaced it. It's just hours and hours of resources consumed trying to find the file. There's only one way that we found to remedy this issue. And you already know it because I've already said it. It's moved to the cloud. By moving to Microsoft 365 or Google Workspace, you move all of that data, all the files off the devices into a very highly searchable index, right? We all say Google that for a reason, or <laughs> we don't say this, but <laughs> Bing that, right? Microsoft has very similar search technology. So when you move all of those files to the cloud, one, they're not on the device anymore. So when that device goes in the lake and destroys everything that's on it, the files can be easily restored on a new device simply by logging back in and it replicates back down to the local device so they can use it offline and online and everything else. But all changes are automatically synchronized between them two and they're also versioned. So when that file is stored in the cloud and somebody else uh, modifies it or edits it, that is a version to where they can easily revert back to previous versions of that same file, you know, one, one version at a time. Likewise, a lot of file loss is not ne necessarily loss. In, in a on-site service, two people might have the same spreadsheet open at the same time, making changes, making changes, making changes. Whoever saves last, wins, right? So if that's the case, the data of the multiple changes could be lost. By moving to the cloud, you get that multi-author collaboration where multiple people can be in the same file at the same time, editing different parts of it without deleting or overwriting the file. So much is saved by handling that. And I also mentioned on there, offsite backups. Um, it's easy. There's actually many solutions out there to back up all of your data in Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace. I know a lot of folks are like, well, if it's in the cloud, ah, what if they lose it, right? Well, there's backup solutions where you can back it up to devices that are on site at your school or in your data center or at a, a major part of your office or even at your house, right? You can, you can back up that data easily from the cloud to an on site system in a worst case scenario. Oh my goodness, I just realized I put number five. Er, it's actually number six. Find that file. The last one that I will mention, our top sources of tickets in the last year in charter school organizations is we started creating our own ticket category for it called Summer Chaos School Startup Sessions. As you know, schools run until summertime and then they break for a summer vacation. Most of the time, the way it happens and, and the way we saw it play out and, and put us in, in defense mode so many times is the, the all take off. It's, it's over, right? School is out, time for summer vacations, they're gone. IT staff go, oh, wonderful. And usually after a week of, of being down, IT staff is like, you know what? 
this is a great time for summer projects. We can make things so much better because we have this unique little window of a couple months where we don't have to worry about a lot of the traditional uh, stuff that keeps us busy all the time. I'll say the top one through six issues that are constantly going, right? This is great. And then they go to, to, to start doing projects and then realize everybody took all their devices with them, right? So all the laptops, all the tablets, all the smart whatevers they've got are all disappeared on vacation with the teachers who are all over the place. They're scattered everywhere. So all the grand idea of summer projects are now moot, right? The second thing that happens is when July and August hits, we have a nightmare situation, right? All of these people, I thought that was pretty witty, zippy charter, fast education. All these people that bolted when when uh, summer started, right, all come back. But oftentimes you have a lot of new staff, a lot of new teachers are coming in, a lot of, of, of new technologies, new, new prerogatives of, hey, we're going to roll out a new classroom style, new smart boards, new, 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 new. And if you know anything about technology, anytime you put something new in there, things tend to break, things tend to have problems, right? So... July through August for many years as VIA was growing became our nightmare months where our tickets waited to be to, to be handled, moved from 10 to 20 up to thousands, right? Morale hits an all-time low because the IT staff is like, we, we have no hope. We can't keep up. And you're just treading water well into September, October. Sometimes even November, December is where you finally start digging out and seeing all those tickets you just never even had a chance to respond to, right? And you're like, oh, we'll just close those because that issue has long since passed and gone, right? A lot of challenges, a lot of angry folks that we've learned over the years, the way that we now handle this. First off, we created checklists for everything that happens when school dismisses and when school comes back in. How many times did we forgot to for, forgot forget to change the phone system when people come back in from the summer, you know, greeting, hey, we're no longer here to, hey, school is, is ready. Do you have a sick student? All those kind of things, right? So simple things like that where phone calls would be missed and all that all became part of a school startup checklist. Onboarding staff, we started creating all of like, okay, for new teachers, because a lot of new teachers come in each year. Old teachers move to other schools and, and move to other seniority uh, positions, right? So there's checklists of, okay, for new staff onboarding, we go through this, we communicate this way, even create a video for, for staff onboarding that, hey, when, when they first log into their computer, here's a quick overview of your resources that are available. Here's how you install printers, you know, which saves proactively a lot of the tickets that come in. We also scheduled something that we called IT ticket booths, um, meaning we found that if we went to the school, we actually sent our teams out to the different schools that we support on scheduled date. We would schedule a four hour window where we would say, hey, we will be here. We set up a little booth. We got donuts and cookies. And we said, hey, come on down. If you have any technology challenges, we'll be at your campus on this date and such and such. And so we would have people lining up, not only for the free cookies and donuts, but lining up with their device. Hey, can you show me how? Can you join this, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw a lot of our tickets going down instead of just I, the challenge with tickets. And let me just make sure you guys understand when somebody sends in a ticket, it's the beginning of a long journey, right? It's like, okay, there it is. You call them, oh, they're teaching. Oh, they're no, not available. We left a message. They call back and you know the tech is not available. And you, you play this back and forth game. Again, consuming resources. So by setting up those ticket booths, you just right then, right there, right there. It's always happening, right? The other thing that we started doing is assigning responsibility for the campuses. So this staff has this campus or assigning responsibility for issues. Like you've got all the printing issues, right? Allowed us to, to get that mindset of, you know, stamp it out, stamp it out, stamp it out through this flurry of tickets. And we hired a whole bunch of students. Students are looking for, for internships, you know, a lot of the senior students and things like that. They're looking for hands-on, and, and a lot of the parents of these charter school kids are like, we would love for our kids to get some real-world stuff. So as the systems are created of installing printers, here's how you do it, new device, here's how you do it. A lot of times the students can take a lot of that burden. They're gaining experience. They're either interning for free or at a very low salary or low wage, right? Because they're just interning for that window, for that month, and they learn a ton. It, it becomes this giant win-win. That is it. The top seven technology challenges that your charter school faces and how to solve them in a way that ensures your resources go to where they most belong educating students, supporting the teachers that educate the students, right? 
This is what we do. This is why we called our company VIA. It's a play on words. V-E-E-Y-A is how you spell it. But it's, it's kind of like when you say, I get there via you know, uh, the I-10 freeway. I get there via, it's the way. We found the way to do technology education extraordinarily efficient because it's all we do. All we focus on is technology education. And obviously, <laughs> we love this stuff. So if there's anything that you could, you could use some help with, please look us up, give us a call. We'd love to, to, to spend some time with you. And I just want to say thank you for spending some time with me. Talk to you soon.